we call it the morphology. I think it's important. This is a very important question. And regarding if there's infection, if the WBC's account in the SFA is high. Okay. Uh, let me deal with morphology first. Uh, ever since the strict criteria were introduced, uh, that's a Kruger criteria into the WHO, yeah. the fifth one, we now have a threshold of 4%. Yeah. And that 4%, there is so much error in counting and reaching that 4%. Yeah. I have to tell you one thing, is that every, virtually everyone is reaching under 4%. Mm -hmm. But I think that's more, between you and me, a justification for ICSI treatment. Mm -hmm. Morphology hasn't changed in the past 50 years. Just the the way we count it has changed. So there's absolutely nothing to be frightened about. And the morphology cannot be used as an indicator for to choose one treatment over another. There is okay. also the only time that I have seen morphology in a very bad shape and really bad uh, is in post chemotherapy patients and I have dealt with nearly 7,000 of those patients in the past. Mm -hmm. And there you can see what poor morphology is. Poor morphology also in very, what you call, heavy smokers I've seen. But poor morphology that is being referred to generally within the subfertile population is not really poor morphology. It's just a, the error in counting those sperms. In order to have of five percent, uh, you need to uh, you need to count uh, what you call error in it. You need to count four hundred sperm. I also need to point out there's not virtually one clinic that is accredited on the WHO standards for semen analysis, and yet they're producing these results. Your second question on just a second on the clinical grounds, okay. Is 2%, for example, normal morphology is not an objection to do IUI? There's no problem. We there's no, do. no, no. There, there's no problem. Because there's no evidence. Nobody has shown that here's an evidence that this does one intervention, IUI, does not work and that IVF will work. I mean, of course, I ICSI will work because you're simply placing that uh, sperm directly into the oocyte. The morphology itself does not give you a reflection on the genetic integrity of that uh, of what might uh, of of the conception that may occur. So that's important to bear in mind, provided mm. that the sperm is not round-headed, mm. or that you're not introducing pinheads. The, all the other sperm. Why? The pinheads. Firstly, pinheads won't have a DNA. <laughs> Mm -hmm. The round heads are actually derived from a genetic problem. Mm -hmm. So, and that because in the round heads there's no acrosome, and mm -hmm. so the actual fertilization will never occur. Okay. And so, possibly, I mean, there are in pro possible indicators that ICSI is the answer for that. Round heads. Okay. In, in but given the sheer the overall spectrum of morphology that you problem morphology that you see clearly there's no evidence that it there's any genetic malfunctioning or that could manifest into the offspring okay. so i think that is quite important to yeah, recognize that's, that's very important yeah the second question is about uh, presence of infection high wbc high yeah. wbc count in sfa yeah. uh, and I ironically it's a good question about um, infection in sperm. Ironically, seminal fluid has antimicrobial properties itself. Mm. We must bear that in mind. The presence of WBCs. white blood cells strangely does not signify this infection, although this is just a widely held belief. If we tried to culture many, about 20 years ago, directly from the seminal plasma, and we could not never grow any bacteria from, I mean, this, this was, 
a very long held belief. And this is work 20, 20 years ago, and we put it through a whole body of microbial techniques, and we could never grow bacteria from, uh, from, uh, directly from seminal plasma. We could not develop this work any further because in order to, and we could never understand where, where this, I mean, sometimes we could see E. coli virus, for instance, oh, it's a bacteria. Uh, in, but, but we could not culture it, and that signified to us that there was enough antimicrobial property mm -hmm. within the seminal plasma to neutralize it. Okay. Okay. But is it good to neglect it? No, it, you must not neglect these samples. What I would actually do is, when you're preparing the sperm, I would take that into account and put it through not just one set of gradient, but I'll put it through another set of gradient again. Okay. You know? Now, <coughs> perhaps one of the things uh, that I failed to mention in my earlier talk was how do you deal with very large volumes? Mm -hmm. You know, like 10 mils and 7 mils and, and 6 mils. When people start preparing uh, sperm sum, they will virtually lose everything. Mm -hmm. And when I mentioned about adapting your protocols, you had to adapt it, not, not just use one standard SOP. And the reason for this is that if you put 10, 7 to 10 mils straight into gradients, you lose everything. What you need to do there is bring everything down, condense it, get rid of the seminal plasma, mm -hmm. and then collect the pellet, and then put that through the gradient and you will have a viable sample at the end of it. The same thing that I'm, when you raise the question about infectious sample, the word infectious has to be in inverted comma because that's an assumption, all right? But I would be very careful to load uh, that in the sp final sperm preparation to have any of those white blood cells okay. present because that, that, that may well impart what I'd say free radicals yeah. and that may well damage the whole fertilization process and especially if you're doing ICSI yeah. it's not worth it. it. You have to, even if need be, put it through a third gradient, mm. you know, just to make sure. Yeah, yeah. And any prophylactic antibiotics? Well, there's no evidence. Okay. There's absolutely no evidence that antibiotics will solve that problem. I want to hear your opinion about the automated uh, machines for similar fluid assessment. Okay, uh, I mean there is scope for it. I think the first thing laboratories need to learn is how to do things properly by the WHO standards first. And most clinics don't do it. I think there is a lot of, a lot of good things about automated systems because it takes out away some of the subjectivity, in, especially in terms of motility analysis. And that's why I was so pleased that when my consecutive ejaculate study was published, that was based on manual assessment, but that was verified mm -hmm. by computerized system by another clinic later in a couple of, a year or two later. And that confirmed that the linear progression in the second ejaculate was far more superior than the first. So that's the take home message. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anything else?